Reminder, exam one is going to be in nine days here, Wednesday, February 28th. So you want to start perhaps thinking about reviewing, trying to remember definitions and theorem statements. Certainly theorem statements that have names, like the GCD is a linear combination theorem and Euclid's lemma. Uh, those are examples of theorems that have names. sock shoes property. Certainly those are things that you should remember. Definitions, well, you know, I would say something like define what a group is. Or, you know, that, that probably would be something that would show up on the test. And you'd want to do a full definition. Again, it doesn't have to be word for word exactly what is in the book, but uh, it should have the same meaning as the main thing. Right? You should understand it well enough that you can write it down. Again, not necessarily word for word, but with, this, with the right meaning. Okay? I'll say more things about this as we get, continue getting closer here. Today's lecture, mostly we're going to focus more on cyclic groups. Look at these theorems and corollaries that we thought about empirically last time, meaning by experience, by thinking about examples. And we want to write down their statements. I've got them on the PowerPoint. And look at the proofs of some of them. That will probably continue into Lecture 9b. And then we also want to introduce Chapter 5, I think at the end of the lecture 9b, the idea of something called a permutation group, which uh, get more complicated than cyclic groups. Okay. Uh, before we do that, though, I was playing around with Mathematica, as I often do. And I actually figured out a way to get Mathematica to make Cayley tables for un for any n that you want. Here's the code. I, you, you, don't have to write it down right now. Um, I put the PowerPoints on Google Drive as well as the Mathematica notebooks, so you can just go there. What this function does is, is it essentially construct a table, constructs a table of the elements of UN, checking to see for a given n whether it's relatively prime to a given i. Remember, the elements of UN are positive integers less than n that are relatively prime to n. Co-prime means relatively prime. Co-prime q then means, is this relatively prime or not? If it is, it comes back true. If it's not relatively prime, it comes back false. I want it to come back with an i if this is true and null, meaning nothing, if it's false. Though actually, that doesn't quite work as I hoped. I had to also do a select um, function to get rid of the nulls. Maybe there's a fancier way to do that, or a nicer way to do that, but that's what I had to do. And this is a uh, code that creates the actual Cayley table <laughs> itself, once you have the elements of UN. Let me go ahead and illustrate this in Mathematica now. Okay, so again, this will create the elements of UN, for example, U10, except it's going to include some nulls in there. Oh, I thought it did. I guess I had the selector already. If I didn't have that select function there, it would include nulls. This then can, uh, creates a Cayley table. I can create a Cayley table then for U10. There we have it. And you can double check that this is right. We're doing multiplication mod 10. So for example, 3 times 7 is 21. Mod 10 is 1. 3 times 9 is 27. Mod 10 is 7. And you can see that 1 and 9 are the only ones that are their own inverses. This one does happen to be cyclic. Remember, though, that u8 was not cyclic. There, every element is its own inverse. And you see these ones down the diagonal. But you can use this code for even bigger values of n. For example, what's U32? What's its Cayley table? There it is. We're seeing the whole thing. Not quite. Not quite seeing the whole thing, but you can scroll over this way. Okay. And of course, with all these things, you, you can put them in a manipulate if you want. And watch how the Cayley table changes as any change. Of course, the number of elements in UN is what? We talked about this last Friday. What's the number of elements in UN in general? It's related to a new function that I talked about last Friday. 
Euler phi function. <coughs> so for example, the number of elements in U32 should be Euler phi of 32, which is 16. We have 16 elements here. Four, eight, six, uh, 12, 16, okay? U, U32 has 16 elements in it. All right, so I, th I had fun doing that. It's quite bad. All right, <clears throat> on to the main content. So in the, the PowerPoints here, I've written down the main theorems in chapter four. So technically speaking, you probably don't have to rewrite these. But you may want to just to sort of, I don't know, maybe start to write them to start to try to memorize them. There's this criterion for a to the i equal a to the j. It's kind of a long <coughs> theorem statement. Here it is. I think it's not too bad. Let G be a group and let A belong to G. If A has infinite order, then the only way A to the I is going to equal A to the J is if I equals J. IFF again means if and only if. So in the case where A has infinite order, when you consider powers of that A, they're only going to equal each other if and only if the powers themselves are the same. Certainly one direction of the proof of that would be trivial. If i equals j, then certainly a to the i equals j to the j. But what about the other direction? We'll look at it here in a minute. The second part involves an if and only if as well. Suppose the order of a is some positive integer n. Part of the conclusion of the theorem is that the subgroup, cyclic subgroup generated by a then has these n elements. You could say in simplest form. It's not that you can't raise a to a higher power. You could raise a to the 2n power, for example. But it would always equal one of these. And you can make this if and only if conclusion. a to the i equals a to the j if and only if n divides i minus j. So we want to look at proofs of these things here today. And this is often the case in class. To save some time, I'm not going to do full proofs. I'll give you maybe more outlines of proofs. Suppose we're in the case where the order of A is infinity, not finite. We want to show A to the I equals A to the J. if and only if i equals j. Okay, so again, one implication here, one direction should be pretty easy. It is. I'll go ahead and label it proof, even though these are not full proofs. That direction is easy. If i equals j, then obviously a to the i is a to the j. You're raising a to the same thing. The other direction is not too hard. Maybe you have a little intuition about what to do even. I hope maybe you do. I want to show i equals j here. Maybe the intuition was developed from studying the proofs, maybe from just thinking about examples. What would be a good step to show that i equals j here? Greta's thinking. <coughs> you want to say? Do you think you know? I don't think I know, no. Okay. Anybody else? I could just see the, the wheels turning in your head. That's, I just, I can tell you were thinking about it there. Sometimes you just try the only thing you can try. That's actually what makes algebraic structures 
sometimes people think of it as easier than real analysis. Um, it's more abstract than real analysis is, for us at least, the way we teach it. But it's like you try the only thing you can try, and sometimes, or maybe even oftentimes, it works. And in my mind, the only thing you can really try is here is a little bit of algebraic manipulation. Maybe multiply both sides by a to the negative j. That'll at least get an identity on one side. Maybe that's helpful. What else do you think I should do? I should probably show one more step before I jump to my final conclusion. There's one more thing you can do on the left there. <coughs> Yeah, add the exponents. That means a to the i plus negative j, which means, yes, a to the i minus j equals the identity. But, wait a minute, got to use what you're assuming. You're assuming a has infinite order. So the only way this is going to be true is if that power is zero. Because when an element has an infinite order, a to the n never equals the identity unless the power is zero. So the fact that A has infinite order now can come into play to say I minus J must be zero, so I must equal J. It's definitely good to think about that kind of thing. That's an exam level type of proof. Type of thing you should be able to do for the exam. And again, it's not that it's definitely going to work, but it's kind of like the only thing you can try. And fortunately, trying it, but you think carefully, does lead to seeing that it does work. <coughs> All right, now let's consider this next case. Suppose the order of A is N, where N is a positive integer. There's really two things to show here. First of all, show that the cyclic subgroup generated by A, which by definition is A to the N as N ranges over all integers, that's a definition. There's nothing to show there. What you want to show is that that's actually a finite set consisting of these elements, at least when you write them in simplest form. So what would you have to do here? Certainly, this inclusion right there, that this is a subset of that, that's clear. That's obvious. Clearly. Right? These are all powers of A. Powers 0 through n minus 1. This is every power of A as the powers range over all integers. So certainly, this is a subset of that. Hardly even needs to be mentioned. The only thing you really need to do is show this is a subset of that. So give me an arbitrary element over here. <coughs> you can call it B first if you like. And show it's in the other side. Well, since it's in the cyclic subgroup generated by A, there exists, so what should I call it? Maybe M? An integer m such that b equals a to the m. So what we really want to do then is show that a to the m equals one of these. a to the 0, a to the 1st, a to the 2nd, through a to the n minus 1. Got any idea about what to use here to help us get to that conclusion? Chapter 0 is about number theory. Maybe something from number theory would help. There's things like GCDs, linear combination theorem. <clears throat> Though I don't see any GCDs here. There's white Euclid's lemma. The very first result in the book, what was that? Don't look. Remember what the very first result was? Page one or two? In chapter zero. It was really a theorem, but it 
its name labeled it as a procedure, even though it's not really a procedure, not really an algorithm. But it's called division algorithm. So it's one of those. This L could be a humongous number. But I can always divide it by n and get a remainder that's going to be 0 through n minus 1. The division algorithm implies there exists unique Q and R integers such that m equals nq plus r. And again, I emphasize once more, the uniqueness aspect of this is with respect to the property that this is true. I've mentioned that you know probably six or seven times so far. Realize that it is important to say it's with respect to that property. For example, if you're taking 17 and dividing it by 5, we say the answer is a quotient of 3 with a remainder of 2 because 17 equals 5 times 3 plus 2 and 2 is between 0 and what we divided by 5. But I can represent 17 in other ways using a quotient and a quote unquote remainder. I can also represent it as 5 times 2 plus 7 or 5 times 4 plus negative 3. I could represent it in this kind of equation with other Q's and other R's. But with respect to that property, and that's important here, it's unique. What do you think? What, is, what do you think A of A to the M is going to be? It will equal A to the Q, A to the R, <coughs> you want to say it, right? It'll equal a to the r. Yeah. Try it out. Use properties of exponents and also what you're assuming. But that's going to be important. A to the m equals a to the n q plus r. By properties of exponents, that's a to the n q times a to the r, or a to the n to the q times a to the r. But a to the n, since n is assumed to have order n, is the identity. So this is e to the q times a to the r, which is e times a to the r, which is a to the r. Maybe a little bit of overkill there on how many steps I showed it. I guess I'd be fine with it if you jump from, well, if you skip at least one of these steps, it's probably OK. There's a Q there, by the way. In reality, it's probably OK to just go from here to here as well, maybe remarking since the order of A is N. Any questions? Does it look good? Does it look good, Sam? Both Sam's? <laughs> so, since r is between 0 and n minus 1, possibly equaling 0. Oops, there's a mistake here. There's a mistake here, isn't there? That should be an n. Sorry. I was wondering why you guys were talking back there. <laughs> Possibly including zero, but not including n. That does it. A to the R is one of these. So that shows. The other inclusion, let me just go ahead and write equality. Again, I'm not guaranteeing anything when I say those kinds of things. But I can see this proof being on the test. 
By the way, I will be posting all these a couple old exams probably from the past. Though I gave those exams a long time ago. It's been a long time since I've taught this course. All right, what's the second thing in here? Um, <coughs> number two, show the if and only if thing. One of the directions is easier than the others here. The other one here too, though they're both they both take a little bit of work at least. This direction is a little easier. N dividing i minus j. If I'm going to assume that, that implies there exists an integer k such that i minus j equals n times k. So i equals n times k plus j. And now go ahead and raise a to the i power and use this fact and once again use properties of exponents and the fact that a has over n. So a to the i equals a to the n k plus j, which is a to the n to the k times a to the j, which is e to the k, a to the j, which is a to the j. In that direction is done. The other direction is a little bit harder. I'm trying to show there exists a case so that this is true. Equivalently, if you apply the division algorithm, divide i minus j by n, the remainder should be zero. Keep that kind of thing in mind. I think that's probably the way to go. The division algorithm comes to the rescue once again to say there's this unique Q and R such that i minus j, I'm dividing i minus j by n here equals nq plus r with r between 0 and n, possibly equal to 0, not equal to n. My goal here is to show r is 0. I want to use this fact. That's what I'm assuming now. And I could also use it to say well, okay. I'm jumping the gun a little here. A to the i equaling a to the j is going to imply that by property of exponents. I should really do this. Essentially, again, multiplying both sides of this on the right by e to the negative j. And switching things around, I guess. That equals a to the n q plus r, which equals, once again, a to the n to the q times a to the r. This is, again, e to the q times a to the r, which is a to the r. And R has got this condition here. We know from the previous part, well, this thing over here, it's got to be one of these. And if, if, if R is, well, excuse me, it's one of the powers. 
If r is one of the powers, 0, 1, 2, 3 through n minus 1, yet an equal a to the r equals the identity, that power must be the zero power. r must be zero from this previous part. Previous part. The conclusion of the previous part of the same theorem implies then that r equals zero. Therefore, n divides i minus j. So I'm using this fact that I already proved. r has to be one of these powers, zero through n minus one. But a to the r equals e, so it's got to be the zero power. R has to be Moving on, uh, there are corollaries. The corollaries follow quickly from theorems. For any group element, the order of the element is the same as the order of the cyclic subgroup that generates. In other words, the least, the smallest positive integer power of A that makes A to the n equal E is the same as the number of elements in the cyclic subgroup that generates. If the order of A is n, then this is the cyclic subgroup that generates. There are n things in there. We also know that a to the n is e. Corollaries follow pretty immediately from theorems. What I said there in the past 30 seconds was too fast. You can rewatch the video at about uh, 25 to 30 minutes in. If the order of a is n and a to the k equals e, then n divides k. For example, if the order of a is 7 and a to the k is e, then 7 divides k, k could be 7, it could be 14, it could be 21, it could be 28, it could be negative 7 or negative 14 or negative 21 or negative 28, etc. It could be 0, 7 does divide 0. Right? Anything divides 0. If A and B belong to a finite group and A and B commute, the group is not necessarily commuted. It's not necessarily abelian. But A and B themselves commute. Then the order of their product divides the product of their orders, is the way you could say that first. The order of A times B divides the product, the order of A times the order of B. These are two numbers that are being multiplied. Um, say the order of A is M and the order of B is N. I claim A times B to the M times N power is going to be the identity. And therefore the order of A times B will divide M by the preceding corollary. Okay, M will play the role of K. The commutativity of these two elements, the fact that they commute, <coughs> means I can write this. That doesn't work in general. This is since A and B commute. Again, the group itself need not be abelian here. We're talking about elements that commute. And now you use the fact that you're, you're assuming A has order M and B has order N and use properties of exponents. You get E, the identity. Therefore, the order of A times B must divide that power. If they don't commute, there's really pretty much no relationship between these orders. Pretty much anything can happen. You saw there was a completion problem from chapter 3. It's worth looking at if you've got your book. Page 72, number 50. It's about matrices. 
two matrices actually ended up having finite order under multiplication, but their product had infinite order. It was strange, I think. The matrices did not commute. A times B did not equal B times A. Again, it's number 50 on page 72 if you're interested in looking at that. Again, that was one of the completion problems, and it just involves doing calculations, but it's just interesting. They say, does the answer surprise you? It should seem surprising that when you multiply two elements of finite order that you could possibly get an element of infinite order. But it does happen. All right, uh, then there's this one. Orders of powers of generators of finite cyclic groups. And we don't have time to prove this completely before the quiz, but let's just get a start on it. And I think for sake of time, I'm not going to do a complete proof. But I think I do want to emphasize a few things at least, especially with regard to this equation, I think, more than the other one. Um, so A is assumed to have order n here. It's in a group. The group is not assumed to be finite, by the way. No assumption that the group itself has finite order. It could be an infinite group. There are plenty of infinite groups that have subgroups of finite order, like the matrix groups, those matrices that I just mentioned at number 50. That finite order of the group itself had infinitely many elements. Well, okay, actually before we look at the proof of this, the, the, I think the thing I'll mention before the quiz here is a, what I call a lemma. Corollaries follow <coughs> easily from theorems. They are facts that follow fairly easily from theorems. Lemmas are small facts that are useful to help you prove theorems. And this is actually related to something in your homework that, you, that I turned back to today where I did not quite give full credit at, uh, it was the, the very last problem in the assignment. It was a graded problem to many people because um, you needed a little explanation for what you wrote. Essentially, you, you use this lemma without proving it, essentially. And it's worth proof. Um, suppose G is a group. H is a subgroup of G, and A is an element of G. You can say that if A is an H, then the cyclic subgroup generated by A is a subgroup of H. That's the lemma that many of you use without really bothering to explain why it worked. You may use this in the future, whenever you might need it. Why is it true? Well, certainly the cyclic subgroup generated by an element is a subgroup of the whole group, G. The question is, is it a subgroup of H? So you really only need to show it's a subset. say this. So given an element in here, I want to show it's an H. We basically are done, but you should say a little reason for that. It's partially since A itself is an H. And also, what else could you say to guarantee that B is actually an H? Is it the fact that this is a sub a group, a subgroup of the whole group G? Or is it the fact that this is a subgroup of G? A is an H. Powers of A have to be an H too. Because H is a subgroup, it's because of that. By closure. And since 
H is a subgroup of G. So if you've got an element in H, its powers have to be in H as well. Therefore, this is a subset of H, and therefore it's also a subgroup because we already know it's a group. Cyclic subgroups generated by elements are by definition groups. All right, let's take the quiz.